everybody and welcome into lacrosse now that is travis eldridge i am tom eschen we got a big weekend of pro lacrosse going on week two in the pll and in the nll finals game two we could crown a champion in colorado we're also going to talk some college stuff today as well yeah we've got anthony DeMeo fresh off winning a national championship with maryland he joins us to talk about what it was like to complete that perfect season with the title also when he may be on the field for the Redwoods, uh, banged up here, missing the first couple of weeks of the PLL season. And to talk about that NLL championship, we've got Jake Elliott, our NLL insider, to break down game two of the finals. So we've got some fun to start off with, though, here. From the college season, we continue to obviously to think about that, react yep. to that. And, you know, we make predictions here all the time, you know, on a weekly basis. Some of them are right. Some of them are wrong. Yep. But we also made preseason predictions, Travis. <laughs> and we're going to revisit some of those, have some fun, poke some fun, and also maybe a pat on the back or two along the way. So we yeah. made a bold prediction. This was our December 30th show for 2022, the college season in 2022. We made some bold predictions. We did. I'll go first since I've got the camera here on okay. the, the video portion of this program. My bold prediction was that Mike Sisselberger would break the 80% face-off threshold. And um, he did not have a bad season. I mean, he still finished in third in the nation. He was 62.8%, but not where he had been above 70% in the past. He ended up third in the country, and I was wrong. So Sisselberger did not break the 80% threshold, and it was Zach Cole who led the nation in face-offs. Yeah, what a season Zach Cole had with uh, with St. Joe's. Yeah. Uh, an incredible season for St. Joe's as a whole, and obviously Luke Weirman was terrific for Maryland. You know, I feel like Sisselberger, though, like all the expectations going into the season with Lehigh kind of like goes hand in hand with how Lehigh's season kind of ended up, whereas like really high expectations going in, considering what they did a year ago and with him coming back and and like – they weren't bad. Like, they were a, a team that uh, fought for a Patriot League championship, but not quite to the level that I think maybe the expectations were set. Yeah, I mean, that's it's been – it's you look at what some of the great face-off guys have done, and that has been – you know, T.D. Erlen was consistent. And it, that's a very tough thing to be in this yeah. day and age when you got the next guy coming up. There's so many now, obviously, rules that surround it that have changed over the years. It's really hard to be consistently great in that category, and that's how you know to really appreciate those that have been. Baptiste and Erlen, they don't come around every all the time. And, yes, Sisselberger, a one-year unbelievable season at that last year unfortunately this year it's hard to back that up and he was still great you can't still great you still look at I mean if you take last year out like wow he finished third in the nation that's a great season but for him he set the bar so high tough to reach that and even overcome that which I thought he could do well I mean that's what se separates the guys who are maybe the greatest to ever do it guys like TD Erland and Trevor Baptiste and guys that are just great at any generation's yep group of face-off guys yeah and I think you're right I think it sort of mirrored a lot of what we saw in the Patriot League too last year yeah other than, other than Boston University they had an unbelievably great season but they were really the only one right they, they were the only Patriot League team that was not a two-bid league this year yeah so the to me that there were some uh, underperforming teams that we thought would do a lot better I think I predict one of my predictions was that Loyola was gonna make the final four right didn't I say that when we were previewing <laughs> I, I the Patriot League I thought they yeah. could make a final four run and I was wrong and I think with some other people I think I even saw a couple of articles saying yeah we thought that Loyola would be a lot better and that's another team that sort of underperformed the Patriot League as a whole yeah. not living up to those expectations and, and unfortunately for a team like Army and, and Nick Turn didn't get a chance in the tournament either well speaking of teams that underperformed uh leads me into my bold prediction yeah, what was that travis my bold prediction for 2022 was that syracuse <sighs> was going to make championship weekend Oof, boy would have been the first time since 2013 and um let's just say it didn't work out that way they well, finished four and ten overall they lost six straight to finish off the year you know i think I was thinking about the Syracuse season a little bit uh, this past week is trying to figure out like what this program is going to be moving forward. And Owen Hilt's not being there. I think early on in the season, a lot of people pointed to that being one of the reasons they struggled in, in different parts of the season and they got off to a kind of a slow start. And like you think back at it and they finish four and ten. And like how many wins do they how many more wins do they maybe have if Owen Hilt's is there like. 
I can't imagine he's more than like a plus two win guy, like in just terms. Of, and and it's not just his contributions, but it's what else it does for the rest of the guys on that offense and what it can open up. But I can't imagine he's more than like a two or three win player. So okay, you turn a four and ten season into like a five hundred season or a just below five hundred season or six or seven wins. Like they're still not making the NCAA tournament, and it's still considered not a successful year. So. I, I, it's time for like a reset with the program. And I, I think that's what we learned this year because I like with what they had coming back, it felt like this was, could be a group that could kind of galvanize each other together, new coaching staff, fresh feel. And it just, just didn't work out. You know what I'm thinking about right now is the fact that they put scares in the teams that played in the national championship. How I mean, weird is that Maryland and Cornell? Yeah, they, no, you're they, right. They scared both of those teams that won. Maybe Cornell, obviously, a lot more than Maryland, but they, they, they gave Maryland a little bit of a run as well, and those teams played in the title game. I, I mean, just, it, it blows they, my mind. Outside of, outside of Notre Dame and then Cornell in the championship game, Syracuse was the only other team that was in, within five goals of Maryland. and it, Being you, talked about as one of the greatest teams of all right. time. Right, and you could argue that that Syracuse <laughs> team, I mean, they, they, Syracuse should have beaten Cornell in the Carrier Dome. Cornell did not play well, and no. that was kind of a stretch where they were struggling a bit, but Syracuse should have won that game in the Carrier Dome. I think what it does show you is that the talent was there for Syracuse. It was some other stuff that didn't click. Because talent-wise, I mean, this is what we said about the ACC all year long. Like, talent-wise, you put these rosters next to any of the rosters that were there in championship weekend, and they can compete. It was that for whatever reason in different games and games that needed that were needed to click. It, it didn't click for the certain they just teams. didn't fit. Th- this group of Syracuse players did not fit together. They, they did not just didn't work. They, they didn't work for some reason. They had all the talent in the world. It's no one's fault per se. I mean, you could put some of that on the coaching staff for the past few years, but I think at the same time, sometimes it just doesn't work when you bring a bunch of different guys together, and they might be great at what where they were, but you put them in a new situation, and in this case, it didn't work. It's the same reason why teams without all the best talent win championships. Right? Yeah. There are teams that, oh, they're not the best talent, they're the best team that, because they fit together the best. In this case, this group of Syracuse, a couple of these classes just, for some reason, you know, they're there, they didn't work well together, and I think – you look at ahead to next season, and there's some people leaving, some people coming. You bring in some new vibes into the program. I think it's going to help for sure. It's just this, but for them, you got to be disappointed because this was an ACC right for the picking this year, and you missed that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, because like as good as Virginia, I mean, Virginia made the tournament, but like they weren't unbeatable. No, no. I, I mean, as we any saw. Stretch. Yeah. I, you know, I think it, what it makes you appreciate is that like Maryland, it's so rare that the team that all year long is considered the most talented on the field actually wins the title, Be- especially in a, in a sport like lacrosse where it's one game and done in the tournament. It's so rare that the team that all year long is considered the most talented ends up capping it off at the end with the championship. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for me, we're going to continue on with this segment. The biggest surprise for me heading into the season was Syracuse was not in the top 20. Yeah. You know, and that, that still did surprise me because I think, like you said, there was reasons well, to believe no, no, they, they should Well, no, no, they were in the top 20. They, other, certain teams weren't – certain voters were not voting them in the top right, 20. Right, yes. Yeah. I, they didn't get more respect in that they were yes. number 12 in the nation. I apologize. Yeah. Um, they were in the top 20. Yeah, I, so we can take Not according that. to can, some people. Yeah, we can get rid of that graphic. I, I forgot that they were in the top 20. Some of them – had Syracuse not in their top 20. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a different thing. I, that still surprised me, even going into the year, knowing what talent they had, potential there, and this group just never reached it throughout their entire career. So that was my biggest surprise heading into that. That was at the preseason poll we were looking at at yeah. the time. For you, what was the biggest surprise in the preseason poll before the season started? Uh, it was that High Point and Richmond were actually not in the top 20. And I think, I mean, the Richmond thing is right. Richmond ended up finishing 14th in the country, and I think you could argue they could be even higher with how they performed in the postseason. I mean, they gave that yeah. Penn team all they could handle the first round of the tournament, a Penn team that went on to play uh, in, in in championship weekend. So, uh, I mean, or excuse me, they lost. Quarter ended finals. up going to the quarterfinals they and lost the losing to yep. Rutgers. But still a team that was really good. And so Richmond, I think, showed it. I, I think I probably should have replaced High Point with Jacksonville. Yeah, because uh, the the SoCon this year, the last year of its that, existence, really uh, performed really really well. Yeah, and those those big three teams that we've seen have sort of headlined the SoCon over the the years. 
that they always they seemed like there was always one you know and this year there was two teams Jacksonville and Virginia that had or that Jacksonville and Richmond who had those big wins of course Richmond beating Virginia Jacksonville the Duke win and, and Denver as well so you look at what Jacksonville did and what an impressive season and now they go on and it kind of is going to be funny to see how they fare in, in these new conferences and these new, new leagues and their out of conference schedules are going to probably stay similar but and, and get back into their leagues and some of them split apart it's going to be interesting to see how the SoCon and, and all those teams end up you know you get the feeling that Jacksonville maybe a little bummed that they didn't get a chance they didn't beat Richmond in that championship game in the SoCon the final one because that was their shot because you got High Point and Richmond who are not in the same conference as Jacksonville anymore they're off to the uh, the Atlantic 10 and Jacksonville's in the uh, Atlantic Sun now and you look at that conference you got Utah in there who had a nice season but looks like with Jacksonville what they're building down there they may be a team that is a perennial NCAA tournament team now with what John Galloway has built. Yeah, it's going to be interesting for sure. So that was that was pretty good. Not a bad prediction. Yeah, it was you. okay. I felt of, of all the Sokan. things that I, I picked in the preseason, that was one of the ones I felt okay about. In, in regards to that preseason poll, I did pretty well here. Most dangerous outside the top ten. I said it was Penn. And Penn went on and won the Ivy League. So yeah. that, that was pretty good. And, of course, they went to the quarterfinals in the NCAA. So, you know, I, I talked about uh, B.J. Farrar and Patrick Birkinshaw, Hanley, and, and deep midfield. And I think that all came to fruition for Penn. And, and the Ivy League teams in general, um, we weren't sure. We, and we were listening back to the old, the old shows today. We didn't know what to expect. Thought maybe there could be some rust with these teams. Kind of went back and forth on that. I wasn't sure. You know, after a while, like, well, there was no rust. No, there was zero rust. Owning their craft, and maybe too much was made about all of that. I think I thought about that at the beginning of the season. Really, I mean, these guys are playing lacrosse all the time. They were all doing that, and we learned about that. If you go out and go watch our, or listen to our conversation with Jerry Byrne, you know, and some of these other guys that we talked to towards the end of the year of the Ivy League really gave us a good look at what they were doing to keep themselves at such a high level of play over the course of not playing for a year and a half. So go listen to that because that, that to me is the best look into the reason why the Ivy League performed so well this year. Yeah, we were listening back to the show in the preseason. We were talking about the Ivy League. And, I, you know, you, you look back to 2020, and it seems so obvious now, like hindsight is yeah. 2020. Uh, but it seems so obvious now when you think back at like the end of when things shut down to the pandemic, we we're talking about how great the Ivy League was. It was Princeton. It was Cornell. It was Yale. It was like everything coming together. I think the one maybe surprise, if anything, was that not really surprise was Harvard's emergence as a team that made the NCAA tournament this year just because like they were still building so much with a, a Really to relatively new program under Jerry Byrne in terms of like him taking over that program. So he had he didn't have a lot of runway in terms of how what he was trying to build, but he used these couple of years to build something that they came became super competitive here in, in this season for Jerry Byrne. So I, I think that to me, um, if anything was a surprise, but it really like it almost you almost feel stupid talking about it now because it's like how did we not know the Ivy League was just going to come out and do this because that I mean they were doing even Brown they beat Virginia right before this everything got shut down yeah you know I think that you look at some of the headline guys that left the Ivy League I think there was a lot of talk that all oh, the Ivy League's going to be gutted when they come back they're going to have to rebuild from the start like Sowers of course going from Princeton to Duke and there were other cases like yeah that lost a lot the, but now that you look at what we had in the NCAA tournament I, I think maybe you take Harvard out of that other than Madronic, but they were kind of veteran squad. They had a lot of youth, more youth than some of the other teams, but they were led by some upperclassmen that had been around a while. Yeah. That you, you knew that in those moments they weren't green, and some of them were new to the environment, but they had been around each other and played together for a while. I think we underestimated that, and maybe some of the headline guys that left the Ivy League sort of made us, led us to believe that, oh, you know, they're not going to have as much talent because of the fact that they can't have the extra year of eligibility or what, what have you. So we kind of got led to that when really the, the story was, I mean, Princeton had that group of veterans yeah. at the end of the day that helped them, you know, get to where they had to be at the end of the year, and that was the championship weekend. Yeah, the other one was that I think got better almost throughout the pandemic, despite the fact they lost Jeff Teat was Cornell. Mm -hmm. Like, you had some pieces that got some experience in that 2020 season, but then you added C.J. Kirst 
and some young pieces in the middle to go along with uh, John Piatelli there at the attack unit, and it all ended up working out. And you heard Connor Busick, and you guys can go and watch that on our YouTube page in the press conference after they lost in the championship game, or I think it was also in the Final Four might have been, and talk about the reset of their culture. And, yeah, and you know, it was I, the championship. And I think there's a lot of programs that probably every so often want that. Imagine, you know, we just talked about Syracuse. Yeah. Imagine if they could have just, it's almost like a kid, I'm going to take a gap year, you know, after college. I just need to take a step back. I need to reevaluate and go from there. It's almost like you're, I don't know what other metaphor to describe it as, but you have to sort of reset things, build from the ground up instead of you're just trying to tread water year after year, bring in some recruits, try to punch it and fix holes while you kind of, saw everything down to the ground and you rebuild things back up in Cornell, a perfect example of that. Well, and I think it happens sometimes throughout these programs with like these senior classes. You've got senior classes that it almost feels like even as freshmen, they're being spoken about because they're that talented and they build up to their senior year. It's kind of the culmination of what is four years of work going into it. And I think a lot of times that's kind of when the reset happens. Like I look at Maryland and as much talent as they have, like this is, this next year is going to feel like almost a reset for them mm. because of, like, you know, you have guys like a Wisnowskis and a Fairman who have been there for a while, um, uh, uh, Makar in the, in the back. And so there are all these pieces that have kind of been building to this moment. And now it's like, okay, well, you know, before we knew Wisnowskis was next after Bernhardt. Now who's next? And so there's, there's that question that has to be answered. So I feel like every three or four years you get these resets in a lot of these programs. Yeah, who wears number one next year for Maryland? I don't know. It's a great question. <laughs> I guess we'll find question. out. Yeah, that's interesting for sure. Um, you had a uh, team outside the top ten that was dangerous, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I picked Denver. Mm. Um, not your you best. You know, not your best no. Team. I mean, yeah. look, they, they had an okay season. To their standards, not great. Like, they, you know, finished 9-6. and six. They lose to – surprise, they lost to Villanova in the semifinals by a goal in the Big East tournament. Um, you know, they – we talked about it going in that they needed to find a guy, and they never really found a guy. Like Jack Cannon in his final year had a nice year, 47 points, but didn't just explode. Uh, J.J. Silstrop, who uh, will be back for Denver next year, so that's a positive looking forward for the Pioneers, sat at 48 points. Alex Stathakis, who I spoke about in that, only about fi- only at 56% at the faceoff X. He was good, not great, and I, there was a lot of that across the board for Denver, who... I, you talk about resets like this feels like a big reset for Denver because on top of a lot of the guys that they've lost due to graduation, Alex Simmons taking his fifth year, he's transferring to Syracuse. So there's some things going on that they're going to have to kind of reshuffle and figure out like, all right, what's next for this program? I think that as we continue on in this era of the transfer portal, we also have to discuss, we talk so much Maryland and Rutgers teams where it's been very successful, but there are cases where it doesn't always work to yeah. the best. And that can also set a program back a little bit. And I think Denver might have suffered a bit from that this year. After the year before, they bring in all these guys from Yale. They bring in uh, T.D. Earl and, and what have you. And, you know, you had some core guys there. Ethan Walker, obviously a big loss for them as it was. Yeah. was. But then now you sort of get back to normal this year. It's like, okay, all those guys are gone. And you might have had other guys that played in those spots that aren't, that didn't. Now this is their first time getting it where they're maybe a little bit set back a little bit. So I think there are instances where it doesn't always come out to win a a final four run or a championship or a league win. I think that we also make sure we have to look at the other side of the coin in the transfer portal and say, okay, yeah, it worked great. And it does work great for a lot of teams, but there are cases where it does not. And even a team like Georgetown looked great in this regular season. And now you will go to the postseason and all of a sudden – you look around and a lot of new guys, new places, and you lose. Well, but you know what it's like? I mean, and it's essentially, I, I think this is the perfect analogy because people call it free agency of college sports. It's like free agency in any sport. Hmm. You know, if you're a team, the, the difference, like Major League Baseball, you're a team that decides you're going to build through your farm system. You're going to bring guys up. They're going to get some experience in single A, double A, triple A. It's the equivalent of getting a little bit of experience as a freshman. You start playing a few minutes, maybe a little bit bigger role as a sophomore, and then you step into a leadership role as a senior. Well, you know, these programs go, well, I want to win now. I don't want to wait three years for this person to develop. So you go out and get the the best attackman you can find to transfer in for a fourth or fifth year. And so that maybe takes some minutes away from the freshman or sophomore that's going to try to work their way in. So it's It is a balancing act for all these coaches of, all right, do I want to try to win now? Like, because I could probably bring in a couple of guys that maybe helped me win now. But I also got to figure out how to keep that farm system growing. 
and make sure that the guys that I did bring in and recruit as freshmen because I thought they were talented, like even if they're not ready to be stars yet, how do I make sure that A, they're going to get some minutes so they can uh, get some experience, but B, they get enough minutes and I pay enough attention to them that they're going to want to stay with my program. So there's all of that that's a balancing act for these coaches that becomes really, really difficult. I mean, you look at the Golden State Warriors. I mean, they're the example of that, right? I mean, It's they, the perfect they, balance. They went on and they won their championship with the system that they, the guys they had grown up with. They go in the transfer portal. They get Kevin Durant. They win. Get, they go and win. And then Durant leaves. And all of a sudden, you're like, what now? But, because at that point, you hadn't developed enough guys to be able to get there. But the last couple of seasons without Durant, of course, they lose last year. Uh, injuries, Clay Thompson, yeah. Steph Curry, that also played a factor. But now you've got a core group of guys like Kaminga and Poole and some of these other players that have developed. And with going out and getting maybe the best thing, you don't have that. And it's really hard to sustain excellence over that time, too. I would argue, like, the perfect – team to compare Golden State to is what we've seen Maryland do. Because, like, yeah, Maryland brought in some big-name tranches. They went and got their Kevin Durants with yeah. the Probilskis right. and the Keegan Cons and brought him in. Jonathan Donville. Don, Donville, they, yeah. Donville yeah, they, they get him in to help him win the title. But there's that established culture. The guys like yeah. the Steph Curry, the Draymond Greens that have been there, that have this established baseline that it's not going to drop off. Like, even when it was just Steph Curry, like, they're competitive. They're not the last place team in the league. And they, yeah. I mean, they, they did were pretty. Have, they, they had one I think really. They were. Didn't they had they one, the number one pick. They had one really down year a couple of years ago. Yeah, they, yeah. they got wise. They got wise with that. Wiseman. They brought. But they that, got there Kaminga. were also for your but point. There were injuries, injuries and stuff. But, got hurt and Steph got hurt that year too. But like, there's like there's a with Maryland even on a year where like they deal with some injuries, they don't get that Kevin Durant. Like maybe it's next year. They they're waiting to. They're trying to figure out who's their guy. There's that culture there. They're still going to be competitive in the Big Ten. Yeah. Like there's not gonna, right. it's not gonna all drop because there's there's an established system where they have their guys. Like that's the question for all these teams. I, I think that's the biggest question for a team like Georgetown. You brought on all these transfers, they're now doing it again. Does that become your culture that you're just going bringing in the best fifth gear guys you can get? Like what does that do for the recruits who try to want to come up through the system? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. No, I don't, I don't know either because obviously when it comes that and it's going to ha- this is a, a to me a window in time where it's going to be another two or three years in which everybody has the extra year. The two. fifth year, and, and, yeah. But where there's the in addition to the grad year, there's right. another year for everybody has. So this is going to be very confusing for a while. For the next couple of years, <laughs> yep. and then I think once we get through the COVID years, we'll settle things down a little bit. It'll still be a little chaotic, but I think things will kind of figure themselves out a little bit, and it'll be a little more linear. Right now it's a little bit of a mess because you don't know who's coming back, when they're coming back, and I feel for the recruits that don't know that either. Yeah, They don't it, know it's who's hard. coming back, when they're coming back, they got to make a decision to come in at a certain time when this kid hasn't decided if he's coming back again or they haven't decided if they're in the transfer portal or not when it's still the fault. There's a lot that, unfortunately, these high school kids have to deal with right now when they're saying, I want to go into a program or I want to make an impact early. And there's only so many promises a coach can make. I mean, look at Delaware's goalie situation this year. They went on the NCAA tournament with Matt Kilkiri, who was their starter last year. They weren't sure he was coming back, so they go out and bring Paul Reedy in. They th- all right, they think they've got this great freshman goalie. Turned out to be really good. Won the starting job some time, and then Kilkiri ends up being the guy. But I think like that, those situations are the perfect balancing act because now Reedy feels like, all right, I got some experience in my freshman year. Kilkiri has gone. Now this can be my role moving yeah, forward. Yeah, and you know, so that's the balance. It's a balance, and you say, hey, it's more competition. If you're good enough, you'll play. That, that's the other end of the spectrum too. So yeah. Uh, anyway, team that utilized the transfer portal pretty well, went on to win a championship, and a, a guy used that COVID year pretty well, Anthony DeMeo, winning a title with the Terps this year. Their midfielder, he joins us now. So it's Tony time here on Lacrosse Now. Anthony DeMeo from Maryland joining us. Thanks for taking some time, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. So fill in the blank for me here. Running the table, going undefeated, winning a national championship was what? Uh, it was unbelievable. One of the best experiences of my life. I mean, sum up because like there's pressure on you guys throughout the season. And I, I have to imagine it only builds throughout the year. Like sum up what that pressure is like when you get to championship weekend and you're like, well, I mean, th- we made the, the whole way to here. Like we want to finish the job. 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's definitely, there's something to be said about that. It was definitely a little bit harder just because of all the pressure that you were getting. People were, people were kind of talking about us all year, like we're going to win, we're going to do this, but it was like, we had to stay focused on us and getting better each day. And, and I mean, when people are saying all that stuff about you, it's, it makes it harder because you got to like channel, like you're just keep to yourself. It's about the team uh, getting better each day. And we just had to stick true to that. We couldn't, we couldn't let that go anywhere else. Did last year's experience, obviously it was a very different year for you guys in terms of playing an only big 10 scheduled in the regular season, but did that experience last year help you? Uh, I mean, I think so. Uh, definitely. You kind of have that final four weekend, the year we lost to Virginia. Um, you definitely have that stuck in your head, getting back to that weekend and then just finishing the job this time, um, with a lot of the same guys from that team that lost. I mean, that was just motivation the whole entire year. A lot, we wouldn't talk about it that much, but definitely had that in the back of our head. So when did you decide, uh, and and when did it kind of unfold to you that it was going to be Tony time in the championship game? Uh, I mean, I've kind of, I don't know. I mean, a credit to my teammates, the scout guys all week, getting us ready. Uh, it could be anyone on our offense. Uh, obviously that day it was me in the first half and then we struggled in the second half, but I mean, the defense was amazing. Logan McNaney in the cage was great. Um, and then the guys that, that weren't on the field, there's so many guys on that sideline that do so much for us all week. Um, and then this, all, the six guys on offense, everyone's working together. It's never about, um, one guy uh obviously i had a couple open shots but it's about it's about the other guys who they're drawing uh, attention and all that stuff too so we're all watching and I, I mean you know no offense to you guys but i think everybody in the lacrosse world that's not a maryland fan is rooting for cornell to make things interesting in the second half so we've got an entertaining finish and this and like they go on the five they score the final five goals like you guys collectively and just you on the field like what's it like to watch that happen and you're watching that lead dwindle down. Like, what's going through your mind? Uh, I mean, honestly, this was the first time all year in the second half where I was, like, starting to get a little bit nervous. I think that it was, like, that we, we saw the finish line and we were right there. And it was kind of like we just started to play, play to almost just win the game at that point. And I think that it kind of, like, we, we knew that we were still going to get it done, but I think there was a little bit of, like, uh oh, like your, your stomach kind of drops a little bit. Like the crowd starts getting into it. You just start tightening up, you keep kind of becoming more tense and all that stuff. And I think we kind of felt that on the sideline a little bit. So, um, capping a, a, a career with the championship, like a, as good as, as it seems like it is, like it, now that you've experienced it, how do you sum it up? Uh, I mean, there's no better feeling, uh, especially because in my freshman year, I was able to experience that too. So kind of started and then ended with one. But I mean, the main reason I came back and kind of stayed at Maryland this long was to see the other guys have that same feeling. I knew that feeling from 2017 and to just see the, how happy all those guys were, the smile on their face after the game, uh, how happy the coaches were, like the, the amount of work and investment that each kid on this team put in, um, there's, it's so rewarding to just see that sacrifice pay off and I think that that that's kind of like what I'll always remember about that day all right speaking of championships I know you grew up here in Boston are you a Celtics fan yeah big Celtics fan so you're feeling pretty good after last night yeah definitely watch the watch the whole entire game and I mean hopefully we can keep keep rolling here yeah so like break it down here like how big of a Celtics fan are you we, what what happened here in, in game three that let them take the two one lead uh, I mean, I think Tatum, I, we're obviously Celtics are pretty beat up, but that crowd and that energy in Boston, just Boston always brings that energy. And I don't know, I just don't see them losing at home. So we just got to defend, defend that home court. So uh, I had a chance to talk to your brother, Nick, who of course plays at, uh, at Towson now. And um, we were talking about his favorite movies. And he said he loves uh, Matthew McConaughey rom-coms. Are you in the same category? Are you a big McConaughey fan? Uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> he's always been, he's always been into that stuff. I'm not, I'm more of a show guy than a movie guy. Oh, so what do you like? Uh, um, I like Entourage. Entourage is a good one. Um, it's a, it's a classic. For sure. Uh, I've been getting into some of the new stuff. I thought Ozarks was pretty good. 
Okay. All right. Fair enough. They, I mean, entourage is, yeah, that takes me back to college. And that was, uh, that, that's, a, I mean, just unreal. If, if you can go back and watch it, for anybody who hasn't watched it, they need to go back and rewatch Entourage on HBO. Yes. Who's your favorite character from Entourage? Who's your guy? Uh, I got to go with, I got to go with Turtle. Yeah. All right. That, I, I feel like that makes sense for you. I, I, a guy who grew up, uh, and came up in Boston, but then obviously you moved out to California and that's where you play your high school lacrosse. Like, where does your lacrosse come from? Like, are you a, a, a Cali kind of swag guy? Do you got the Boston toughness? Where, how do you sum up your, uh, you, how you're growing up uh, contributing to your game? I know Coach Tillman would say the Boston tough guy just because he would always be trying to pull that out of me. But I think, I mean, I think a combination of both. I was always my dad. Uh, My dad kind of always coached me when I was younger and he was always tough on me. So, I mean, I think that's like where I got like the competitiveness and all that stuff. And then being out in California, you kind of, I don't know, like you, you're just around the diff- different type of person. And I think that it kind of resembles both. Um, I would say, I wouldn't say that it's one way or the other. Yeah. I, and I've seen pictures of your dad. He, I mean, he fits Boston to a T he's got the hat going on. Like it's like, he's ready for the, the Southie uh, St. Patrick's day parade every day. Yeah. He's got the, he's got the Patriots Super Bowl tattoos on his, on his arm. He's full on, he's full on Boston. He's had season tickets to the Pats for like 20 years. So um, he's definitely Boston through and through. He even tries to keep his accent going. Uh, Even though we tell him that he's lost a little bit, he tries to, he tries to really show off his Boston accent. Yeah. Hey, I tell you what, I was talking to Nick and it came out Nick too. And you guys haven't lived there in a while. So I, it, it comes, it comes through. It's still alive. Yeah, normally when we're, when we're talking faster, it normally <laughs> comes out. All right, let's talk about uh, you guys, you continuing your career. Uh, you're banged up here following the college season. Uh, you're hoping to get on the field for the Redwoods. What are you looking forward to about the opportunity in playing in the PLL? Uh, I mean, it's something that you dream of as a kid. Obviously, uh, uh, the Rables have done a great job getting that league up and coming. And uh, I think they've done a great job of putting lacrosse on the map. And I mean, to just be a part of that will obviously be awesome. And um, just being in that atmosphere with that, with that crowd. And just, I mean, it's just something different all for the past five years. It's been Maryland, Maryland, Maryland. And it's just a different way of playing lacrosse. And, and I think that that that's what will make it cool. I want to come back to Maryland here before we let you go, because uh, something that stood out to me throughout the celebration for you guys was obviously the emotion, but it almost felt like the, and how coach Tillman talks. It's like, he was so happy because you guys put in so much work all year and he wants to see you guys have it pay off at the end. Like, how do you sum up what coach Tillman preaches all year in terms of like putting in all the extra hours, all the work, and knowing that, like, he knows that if you do all that and things work out for you, this could be the ultimate reality. Yeah, and I think at times that's where, like, it, like even myself, like, we, like, can be frustrated some days because we feel like it is a lot. But Coach Tillman does that because – he loves us and he wants us to get that feeling that we did on Memorial day. And I mean, that's all you can ask for in a coach, uh, just pushing the best out of us all the time. He's, he's always been like that. Um, he, I mean, even this year, everyone was telling us how great we are. He brings rat poison into the locker room because he doesn't want us to believe, believe all the, the poison and all what people are saying, because in the end, it's about the 50 guys in the locker room and our coaching staff and support staff and everyone kind of just, and it starts with him from the top, just keeping us, keeping our heads forward and just keep going, put your head down, get better each day. And that's what he preaches. And I feel like over my time, he's taught me so many valuable lessons about more than lacrosse too, like life in general. And that's his goal mainly. Like he just wants what's best and he pushes the best out of you. Wait, he brought actual rat poison into the locker room for you guys? Yeah, he put it on every single table in the locker room. <laughs> Man, I, I mean, Nick Saban preaches it. I don't know if he's ever brought it into the locker room. So that's some next level of motivation from Coach Tillman. Yep. Uh, hey, Anthony, we appreciate the time, man. W- what a uh, career you had and what a way to finish it off. Undefeated national champions. Uh, enjoy the couple of weeks off here to, to get rested and, and recuperate. And we hope to see you on the field in the PLO this summer. Thanks, man. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
So thanks to uh, Anthony DeMeo for taking some time away from the beach. He's all resting and recuperating, trying to get healthy so you can get ready it's for the PLL season. a good place to season. do it. Yeah. I can life, do some of that. You know, life's good when you win a championship, get ready for a pro season. <laughs> you just finished up six years of college. I mean, man, come on, man. <laughs> life, is, life is good That's for Anthony right. DeMeo. Appreciate him taking some time. Uh, we hope we'll see him here for the Redwoods sometime in the next few weeks in the PLL, which brings us to week two of the PLL. They head to Charlotte, North Carolina this weekend. A beautiful facility, by the way, that they'll be playing in uh, the revamped Hounds Stadium that used to be home for the Charlotte Hounds. Shout out Hounds Legion mm. uh, for all the folks out there. They'll be there, there. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure they'll be there. They love all these guys. Some former Hounds playing. Yeah. Oh, plenty of them. Uh, let's talk about some of them. I what did we learn from week one in Albany as we take a look at the results uh, here that you can see on the screen? What, what did you learn so from week one? Obviously, the Atlas sticks out, the, the 17 goals, and you look at the roster and you're like, okay, this team's great, and they showed that in week one. Um, Eric Law, three goals, four assists in that game, which yep. it was crazy good to me. I'm going to talk about them in a second. Okay, then I'll stop. Um, to me, all right, I'll tell you what stuck out. Nick Morocco had 19 saves. And you look at that roster and who they brought in, Colin Kirst as a goalie. And to me, it shows me that Nick Morocco is looking over his shoulder a little bit and saying, hey, you know, I want my job. I got to keep my job. And this is what Paul Rabel envisioned. You're fighting for a spot every week. And Nick Morocco delivered this past week yeah. for the Cannons. I mean, a 16 to 10 win over what has been assumed to be a pretty good Water Dogs roster and team. The 19 saves, what a difference. And obviously, the offense was humming pretty well there, too. But Morocco, to me, stuck out. The 19 saves sticks out in a big way because of what they had. Because I remember looking at that roster this week, and I'm like, hmm. You know, Morocco's better better play well because, you know, Kirst's just coming off a good college career and good run. So he's got to step up, and he did, and he played really well. I think one of the underrated things about the PLO we've seen here over the course of the now four years is what the expectations for the goalies is. Like, you have to, to have a great goalie to be great in this league because they're going to see a ton of shots yeah. with the, the shot clock the shorter field like you're going to see more shots as a goalie than you're used to in playing whether it was in the mll college whatever you're going to see a ton of shots and you got to be great like you got to make a bunch of saves you're not supposed to make if your team's going to be successful week in and week out that's what nick morocco did in week one yeah he was excellent so that, that's a big part of how good they could be at the end of the year more than that in a second yeah because that offense is just scary good. A lot of, um, lot of scores. A lot of attack. <laughs> Got a lot of attack, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, speak. So what I learned from week one is that the Atlas are the team to beat. I mean, you look at what they did offensively. Five goals and two assists from, uh, from Jeff Teat. Three goals and four assists from Eric Law, as you mentioned. Chris Gray had three points. I mean, that's just the attack unit. Their midfielders did some damage as well. I mean, they hang 17 on the Redwoods in week one. A Redwoods defense I'm going to talk about here in a second. That is good. Like they, you're talking about a Redwoods defense that just a couple years ago we're talking about is maybe one of the best in the league. They hang 17 on them here in Week One. Ah, man, you look up and down this roster, and then you add in the fact uh, they are great at the faceoff X with uh, with Trevor Baptiste, who went 63 percent against TD Erland with a two pointer. Yeah, with a two pointer. Tucker Durkin defensively is still back there. I mean, this team is loaded. Yeah, they're really good. And, and I was looking over the stats. I'm like, Eric Law had four assists. <laughs> Eric Law, he had nine assists all of last year in nine games. Does that tell you? They, Eric Law is a feeder, a guy that not, not he's been t turned into a feeder. Because he's a of, finisher, I mean, usually. He, he is a finisher. <laughs> like I said, he's a finisher, but he was turned into a feeder because there's so many options around him that can go and score at any yeah. moment. So. Willing to give it up, but also saying, hey, there's a lot of talent around me. I don't have to shoot it whenever I get it. There's other guys that can do that, too. And that just shows you how good this offense is. Man. Yeah, I oof, man, I am pumped to see them the rest of the year. I, this is a special, special group. Yeah. Uh, and I spoke about their defensive midfield unit going into the you, week. You I did. mean, yeah, you Kobe did. Smith and Danny Logan, Peter Durth. I mean, this team is just stacked. Yeah. They, they, how, like, talk about hitting the reset button. Like, they hit the reset button after year one with, like, a very veteran team. Paul Rabel got moved over uh, to Pinnell. To Pinnell left, and 
Now look at Hartzell now look at them. That team. They have really refreshed. They they really turned things around. What is, what's the what's the subway commercial? The refresh, be fresh. Something that that's like that. that's yeah. what the that's what the Atlas. Yeah, have they're done. jeeters in those commercials now. Yeah, it's wonderful. So is Tom Brady and Gronk. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Look ahead to this week in Charlotte. What will we learn from this week? I think, speaking of that game, I think the Redwoods' defense is better than the 17 goals they gave up against the Atlas. Like, the Atlas, I think, are that good, so they didn't make the Redwoods' defense look that good. But, first of all, in goal, both Jack Kelly and Tim Troutner played. Neither of them had good save numbers. They both struggled. But both of them, I would consider, like, guys who could be top half of the league goalies for any team in the league. I think the Redwoods have to feel normally pretty good about their goalie situation. They did not have good days. I mean, you look at their close defense, Eddie Glazner, Garrett Apple, Finn Sullivan, Arden Cohen. Like, this is a, a unit that not only um, has been good in the past, but they've got continuity. Like, Arden Cohen is a guy that's familiar with the system that Apple and Glazner played at Notre Dame. Finn Sullivan's a terrific defender we've seen since his days in the MLL coming out of Hofstra. So I, I just... I think that they're a better unit. I think they just got the Atlas when things are starting to click for a team that may be the best offense in the in the whole league. I think they will be better than that here in week two. Okay, I like that. Um, I've got a couple now for mine. I know I only inserted one okay. into what our do you graphics. Got? But I'll start. I think Atlas Cannons could be a championship preview. I think those two yeah. could be two of the best teams in the league. you got Lyle Thompson on one end for the Cannons. We just talked about how great the the, the Atlas are. You know, Thompson goes 4-2 and two to start his year. The Cannons have a lot of different things working well for them. And if Morocco is going to play like this in goal, there's, there's not many games in the PLL, don't forget. You know, they don't play 20 games. Right. Like, you can get uh, be a hot goalie, and you can kind of ride that out through the summer. So, you're in good shape there. Well, this is going to be a test, quite the test yeah, well, for them against the Atlas. That's why I want to see. I want to see what's going to happen. Yeah. My other thing is... The Archers better score some goals this weekend. We talked about it last week when we were previewing the season that their offense has underachieved since day one in the PLL. They scored 10 goals in an 11-10 goal loss to the Chrome. 11-10 loss to the Chrome. And it feels like I've seen that game 15,000 times. I don't understand it. It's how they lose every week. (laughs) I know. You're right. Because it's always like 10-11 goals. They should be scoring 17 like the Atlas. Yeah. They should be averaging Maybe 14, 15. I don't really know what the actual numbers would be on a good team, like an average here. But they should be up there in terms of the league leaders they should have been over the years. And now you've got a team, a shorthanded team, where half the chaos are out playing in Colorado in the NLL finals. You've got to take advantage of that, and you have to start scoring goals. Or I don't know what to tell you. I mean, Tom Schreiber only had an assist in the first week of the season. Yeah, of course, you know, Manny and Holman got themselves involved. Matt Moore didn't do anything, just had a couple shots. I, I don't know that the, the Archers better. The offense needs to be better. I don't understand why it's not good. It, yeah. it just, there's, there's something going wrong systematically, philosophically. The guys just aren't in the right spots to score because they all are scores. They have to be put in the right spots to do so. Oh, did, it looks like they'll be without Grant Amen again this week. It sounds like he's listed as doubtful and, in the injury report. The, I don't. But well, Grant Amen is um, amazing, and he makes us. I mean, he was the best attackman in the league last before year. Before the league even began, we saw the no, roster. You're right. Grant Amen wasn't in the league. We're like. How is anybody going to keep up with the Archers? And that could not be more or less true at this point. Talk yeah. about predictions that went wrong. <laughs> Grant Met wasn't even on that roster the year one. We all said, oh, this is crazy. How, team good is, is unbelievable. how good is this team? Yeah. And they have not lived up to the hype. Yeah, Grant Met not being there and Connor Field still playing with Buffalo hurts them for sure. So that... Obviously, those are pieces that they're ex- going to expect to get back here at some point. They didn't have Connor Fields in that first round no, no, either. No, you're right. And I, I know it's I don't, changed. But. No, I don't, I don't have any excuses for him. I, I'm the one who is saying, like, Tom Shriver has got to prove something. This, our, this Archer's offense as a whole has to prove that they are as good as we thought they could be. Like, I don't, you know, you, I, watched the end, I was watching the end of the game, and the way the Archers moved it, when they're down by t- three or four goals in the fourth quarter – the, the question is, like, where was that all game? Mm-hmm. Because, like, in toward the end of that game, it felt like they could get any shot they wanted. Marcus Holman's camping out in the middle, finding ways to kind of slide through the defense, and he's open and he's scoring. So where was that for the first, I don't know, 35 minutes? That That is the question. Like, they've yeah. got to come out like that and play with that kind of desperation at the beginning. So I'm going to say that, 
we'll see some of that, I guess. We'll learn a little. I don't know if we're going to learn a lot, but I mean, they're they're playing a K. They have to. I I don't know if that they really, should. They, if the they don't beat that chaos segment, team, I just have to point it out. I guess. Yeah, if they don't beat that chaos team, that's I, yeah. Then we'll, we'll learn a lot. We'll, yeah, that's that's not a. You got to you got to win those games. Someone might get fired if that was a thing. <laughs> if they Are don't you, beat the chaos a, team. A bold prediction here after <laughs> I don't Charlotte. Know if maybe unprecedented in the PLL. I don't think anybody's ever been fired. Got anything else in the PLL here week two in We're, Charlotte? I, I'm excited for the weekend in Charlotte. should be okay. a lot of fun. Week two, everybody's settling in. See Jeff Teed out there doing his thing, working toward an MVP award. Yeah, starts uh, Friday night. Uh, Saturday night, we've got game two of the NLL final series shifts from Buffalo, that raucous atmosphere, out to Colorado. To preview that, we've got Jake Elliott with us. So now we get a chance to look ahead to game two of the NLL finals coming up on Saturday. We've got our NLL insider host of the lacrosse classified podcast, Jake Elliott, joining us now. Hey, Jake, if game two is anything like game one, we are in for a treat. I want to start with Matt Vince because today is his birthday and it's a big one. He turns 40, and he puts on that performance in the finals. Like, can you sum up what this dude is still doing? Well, no, I, I can't because I think it's unprecedented what Matt Vince is doing right now at the age of 40. And, and listen, I don't, I don't think we really saw Vino's best game in, in game one, and I think he's going to play even better in game two, which might be a bit of an issue for Colorado, but I think Dylan Ward is, is going to play better himself. So, but to, yeah, to, to do it at 40, and, and like I think he's going to win his eighth goaltender of the year this this season, which is just bonkers. He's pushing for another championship. I think that would be number four. And actually, it was Christian Del Bianco who brought up the query of, never mind goaltender for Matt Vince, is he maybe the greatest box lacrosse player of all time? When you look at his resume, and what he has accomplished both indoor uh, in, in the summer and through the National Cross League, you can make a case for it, man. And, and I don't know. Like, I think he's got at least three, probably four years to go. And, and Buffalo is not slowing down anytime soon. Like, they're a good young team. And if they can keep that core together, sky's the limit, man. Like, he could, he could fill up his fingers by the time it's done. Yeah, that's an interesting debate, yeah. I guess, to have. I don't even know if it is a debate at this point. So he has the 40 saves. Ward has the 40. My question to you, Jake, is was this Colorado's best shot? Was this game won everything Colorado had in the tank for Buffalo and Buffalo will go on and win in Colorado this weekend? Nah, I think if they started at home, then I would say, yeah, maybe. But the fact they're going back to Ball Arena, where they are a very, very good team, and that place is going to be just as wild as what we saw in Buffalo with 15,000. I know their their hockey team there is going to the Stanley Cup, so mm. it's a good good time in Denver right now to be a sports fan. And they're going to get behind their mammoth there. I just I don't know if they have – like, I think all things being equal, goaltending – defense, transition, coaching. I just think it comes down to the offensive end a little bit more here, guys, and especially without Ryan Lee in their lineup, which they have been able to overcome to this point, and they still put up 14 on the Bandits, which is no easy feat here. But trying to limit Buffalo to, to less than 14 is a real tough challenge, and, and we'll see what happens. I think being at home... Listen, we're going to be down to the final possession, another one-goal game, like we've seen through the entire playoffs here in the National Cross League. You think back to how Buffalo even got into the final, <laughs> both those games came down to literally the last second of the game, both of them. So that, that's how fine the line is here in the NLL playoffs. Well, I, I want to mention that final possession because I was re-watching it again here this morning, the end of that game, and – the, the goal there by Nick Weiss, it it almost felt like it was just a, it, it, I guess, a, a mistake by the Mammoth in terms of, like, not recognizing the shot clock situation, where that ball is going to ricochet, and the substitutions. Like, walk people through that final possession because it feels like this has been the thing. Buffalo has found ways to execute late in games when other teams haven't quite done it. Yeah, you know what? It's almost like they just find it a way to do enough every single time. And and it reminded me of of Jeff Cornwall for the Saskatchewan Rush scoring yeah. the 
the game winner very, very late, a lot later than, than a minute to go. But to get get it out of a guy like Nick Weiss, who's such an unsung defender on that team. I, I had John Tavares on the podcast this week, and he was talking about Nick Weiss and, and the job that he has done and what he means to that team. And he doesn't get the recognition that he should, but then he gets the, the game-winning goal and just goes off in a celly and, and going crazy, which was a lot of fun to watch. But you know what? Uh, Buffalo just finds a way to get it done. And as far as the scenario goes, you know, you're right. Late in the shot clock there, and I think it was Zed Williams who just tried to kind of smack the ball into the corner. And I don't know if he fanned on it or just kind of whiffed on it or what but he didn't get the ball deep into the corner to get the line change in and then compounded the problem by making the line change. And it wasn't just him. There was two guys that were high and they both just went 90 degrees straight to their bench thinking, I don't want to play defense and and late in a a one goal game here in a championship final. And they needed to go back and and try and slow that transition down. And Buffalo just pounced on the opportunity and made the most of it. Yeah, they they sure did. I did want to ask you about Zed Williams, the good stuff he's done. Because he's been, with like you mentioned, no Ryan Lee. He's been incredible. Four goals for us. That's the best output he's had all year long. And he does it here in the finals as well. He had 10 loose balls in game one as well. Just for perspective here, 24 points in the playoffs for Zed in five games. He had 45 points in the whole season in 16. It, to me, it felt like we were waiting for this to emerge from Zed Williams all year long after that big acquisition in the offseason. This was scored like the swarm Zed Williams now playing for Colorado. What has he meant to this mammoth team, and can he be enough? Does he have to do more to get the, a win in game two? Yeah, I don't know if he's done more. I want to give Brett McIntyre a bit of a shout out, who's kind of been the guy that stepped in for Ryan mm-hmm. Lee. And I think he had three and two, including the first goal of the game. And for a guy that has barely played this season, for him to be kind of thrust into that role and perform and produce like he has, it's been pretty impressive. But going back to Zed, like I, I think when Zed is the number one, he knows it's on him and he gets way more aggressive and he gets off way more shots and he wants to go to goal. But when he's playing second fiddle or even third sometimes when Ryan Lee's in that lineup, then he kind of gets into a back seat and more of a a feeder or facilitator role. And I don't think that's when Zed's most effective. So when he's getting the pill and it's like, yeah, you're the guy on the right side, he puts it on himself and and goes and gets it. And and when he doesn't have to, I think that's where he kind of takes a bit of a back seat. So right now, Zed's the guy. He knows he's the guy. He knows he has to be the guy, and that's when he plays at his best. Well, speaking of a team with plenty of guys, Buffalo has guys like to any given week, it could be somebody else. I mean, Dane Smith obviously nearly set the points record. Josh Byrne is terrific. Uh, Connor Fields, you, Chris Cluche, you go up and down. But it's DeHogan Nanakoke in this finals game that goes off for the five goals. And I, we were talking before the draft last year about this guy – and teams weren't sure what to make of him after everything that happened at UAlbany and he, and he leaves and maybe a little lost in terms of who he is as a person. Buffalo takes the chance, brings him in, and it feels like maybe there's no other team like Buffalo that could have brought him in and had him succeed quite like this just with the, the pieces around him. And now he's thriving. This, this rookie season for Dehoka, I mean, everything you could have expected and more? Yeah, I think so. I think he's probably exceeded expectations there a little bit. I've I've coined Dehogan Anico the chosen one here, boys. Uh, TN1, if you work that in, the chosen one for Dehogan Anico. And, and he is just, you know, like, again, here's a guy that has been a number one pretty much his entire life, wherever he has played. And now he's, he's clearly a number two in behind Dane Smith, but he has figured out a way to be super effective, whether he's playing on ball or off ball, this kid has every tool in the bag that you can imagine. And you're right, Travis. I think you nailed it. There was no better spot for Dehoga to land than in Buffalo, a team he grew up as a ball boy, hoping and wanting and, and wishing that one day he would be a bandit. And I think as the year has gone along, He is a rookie has just kind of kept his head down and his mouth shut. And how can you not when you have that kind of locker room surrounding you and and a head coach and John Tavares that he probably grew up idolizing. So as the season has gone along, I think his personality and his maturity have really grown and blossomed to a point. Like, I don't know if you guys saw the interview where it was like, 
yeah, the, the best advice I ever got was don't suck, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and like it, it was hilarious. Right. And I don't think you would have seen that from Dehoga early in the year, but now he's comfortable inside that locker room. He's part of the culture. And when you're getting a five spot out of your secondary guys, you're going to be really tough to beat. And whether it's inside, outside, the guy might, might set the dirtiest pick in the league, guys. Like, he just blows guys up when he goes to set picks. And, and I don't know how you stop him one-on-one. I don't think he can. Yeah, I'm, because the skill level has never really been the question with him. It's, it's up here. It's does he have what it takes to be a professional and show up week in and week out and produce. And, and I think with the pieces around him, we're going to see it. Yeah, Buffalo was the spot for him to be where he could just – find his way and fit in and follow the lead of, of some guys that have been around a long time. And one day he will be the man in Buffalo. Uh, trust me on that. Like the, the kid is, is the sky is the limit for, for Dome. More on that, the culture in Buffalo, you know, the uh, involved there, of course, and in coming into it, but what, how has it been able to be cultivated and be such a fertile ground and be such a great place to play for a guy like him or anywhere else? How have they, they been able to create that, Jake? Yeah, I, I think it's the, the core, right? It's, it's Fraser, Byrne, Dane, McKay. Those are the guys that are living in Buffalo and, and kind of stirring the drink there. And then they get to spend the, the offseason with the chaos as well. And they're just around each other all the time. And they're so genuine with each other they're like they're they're genuinely thrilled when their teammate scores and they're so happy for them and it's just infectious right and and some teams have that and they can keep it other teams it may be a year where they feel it and then they don't again but the culture there in buffalo and you got to think it starts from the top with the gm and and d-man and and steve dietrich right and scott loffler the president there have brought these people together and Again, when you got the greatest box lacrosse player of all time calling the shots there on the bench, how do you not follow follow that? All, you know, like it's it's unbelievable what John Tavares has done in this league and in this sport, and you can't question it. So I think you know it just trickles down from from the management to the coaches to the to the leadership group there and and throughout the rest of the team. Well, and I think you talk about that culture, and we had Chris uh, Cluche on a couple of years ago when he had first gotten traded to Buffalo, and he admitted, like, he went to Philadelphia, and it was a new team, obviously, and they were trying to build their own culture, and he kind of let himself go a little bit, ate a little too much, got overweight, goes to Buffalo, and he's like, hey, I I figured out, like, I got to learn how to be a professional, and it was like, it, it took him that to be in that situation to thrive, and, and now, I mean, the goal he scored to make it, I think it was 14-13, um, or uh, excuse me, 13-12 was unbelievable. The one hand diving in, around in, in that final series, but another guy that they pick up in a trade that now has become part of this, you know, key nucleus. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, good Canadian boy there and Chris Cluche as well. And they gave up a, a pretty penny to, to go and get Cluche, but let's not forget, what was he trying? I'm trying to recall, like, number two overall or, or number yeah, one? Even. Yeah, he was a highly regarded mm-hmm. guy Still, coming yeah. into the league. Yeah, so I mean, uh, this kid can play ball, right? Uh, championship there at Carolina, and and he's going to be successful wherever he goes to play. But again, like uh, when he got to Buffalo, I think they probably gave it to him straight. Like, hey, you have a lot of talent, but you're not making the most of it. You need to get in shape a little bit here. And and guys like Dane and Chase and and Josh dragged his ass to the gym on a daily basis and got him there and. You're seeing the fruits of of his labor and his hard work, but also because of the culture there in Buffalo to get him to to go to work. So, how does Colorado overcome all of this <laughs> in Game Two, Jake? How are, what what, yeah. what do they need to do? I know we've been just fawning over the <laughs> Buffalo Bandits here. I kind of feel a little guilty, but <laughs> listen, they need to get a, off to a good start. I think the first five seven minutes of that lacrosse game is going to be real key. Get the crowd engaged. Get them behind you. Get a couple of early goals and and. Eli McLaughlin doing that will will fire things up there, right? He knows how to get things going in, inside Ball Arena. And I think Dylan Ward's going to have to play one of his best games of his career because I think the defense is going to be pretty solid. They may get a little production out of transition, and I think their, their goal scoring, their offense has proven they can do it without Ryan Lee. They can, they can score some goals. So I think they need a few more stops out of Dylan Ward, get off to a quick start, and, and try and keep that momentum through the 60. 
All right, so you got a pick. Or are we going back to Buffalo for game three, or is this thing ending in, in Colorado? You're going to put me on the spot right here, right now on LSN. I think the Buffalo Bandits take this thing, guys. I, okay. You know, I think they're thinking back to 2019 and, and the Calgary Roughnecks and losing in overtime in the deciding game. And, yeah, I'm sure they would love to, to go back home and, and win it in front of the city of Buffalo in, in their home arena. But you start playing with fire like that, you're going to get yourself in a world of trouble. So, you know, however the, the cup comes back to, to bandit land there, I don't think they're going to care at the end of the day. And Buffalo, for me, has just been the best team all season long here. And biggest game of the year, I think they're going to play their best game of the year and they're going to get it done. It's going to be tight, but I think it's going to be the Bandits. I will say, you could say in that locker room, we had our moment at home. I mean, what an incredible atmosphere oh, that, that was, was right? Uh, Unreal. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, you know what? I've, I've called a number of games there in Buffalo over the years, uh, traveling there for regular season and stuff. And, and it's electric in there for those games. But what I saw there last Saturday night, I mean, don't forget, guys, coming out of the pandemic, there was like 6,000 fans their first game. Then went up to like 7, 8. And then they got to 10. And then as the year goes along, they started to come back and back and back. And now you're looking at 15K, just absolutely rabid fans going bonkers. And that's what Bandit Land's all about. They're the best fans in the league, bar none. But, like you said, there's a lot of fever going on. Colorado's feeling Colorado. pretty good. They've got, like you well, said, no, the yeah. Avalanche. You got Russell Wilson. Uh, you know, they got a lot going on right there. The, the sports vibe. Why well, are you going to bring up Russell Wilson, man? You know you're talking to a C Seahawks fan over here. And you... <laughs> well, Anyways, uh, I, yeah, no, you know what? Like I said, Colorado and Mammoth fans are, are right up there as far as the top of the league. I go, you know, Buffalo, Calgary, Colorado, Saskatchewan are the top four in the league. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And and they're going to bring it. They'll be they'll be packed inside the loud house there, and it's going to be an electric atmosphere. I can't wait to see it, guys. It's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, it's going to be terrific. Hey, don't worry about the Seahawks. CFL season's right around the corner. All right? Go Lions, baby. Go Lions. See, there we hey, go. we got a Canadian quarterback for the first time in like our, our team's history and, and maybe a starting quarterback that's Canadian in CFL in a long, long time since like Russ Jackson back in the sixties or something. Wow. So I'm fired up here for lions football as well. Let's See? talk about that more at a different time. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> Thanks Jake. We appreciate the time, man. Enjoy this weekend. Okay. Always a pleasure. You too guys. So we'll get to the CFL breakdown, and we'll launch a podcast here soon. <laughs> Opening um, weekend we is this weekend. In the CFL? In the CFL, yeah. Wow. I, was, I was watching the, uh, the NLL yes. Finals game one, and they had a, they had a, the a look ahead yeah. Thursday through Saturday. You got doubleheader Saturday night mm, yeah, I mean, on TSN. That's Let's probably go. worth watching. You know, I would say if you're not watching lacrosse, then right, you yeah, probably could watch that. Check out the CFL. All right, let's wrap things up here. And it uh, kind of conflicted with our show last week. Last Thursday, the tour time giving out Logan Wisnowski's for the men. And it was Charlotte North for the women. And one of the more surprising tour time trophies I think we've seen in a long time. Because yeah. everybody last year, I think, expected North. And I don't know if that was the case this year. Well, yeah. I mean, last year, Charlotte North not only broke records but won the national championship so it makes sense the thing about this year with charlotte north getting it is that if charlotte north won the award this year then there was zero percent zero reason why kylie o'miller shouldn't have won the award the year that he she broke the all-time points record there's like if you're if if the category if the award stays the same in terms of what goes into whoever wins the award every year. Kylie O'Miller should have won the award if you're going to give it to Charlotte North this year. That's my problem with this, is that how do you give it to Charlotte North this year over Jamie Ortega, who beat Charlotte North how many times on her way to winning the national championship with the best team in the country? And Kylie O'Miller, who ends up losing to the team that goes on to win the national championship the year that she was the, a finalist? Yeah. She doesn't get the award, but the best player on Maryland, Zoe Stukenberg, who had a great year, but she didn't have a record-breaking year. She didn't transcend the game. And that's where, like, Charlotte North got this because she transcended the game and is taking the game somewhere that it hasn't been, and she's got the notoriety. But if that's the case, Kylie Olmiller did that before Charlotte North was on the college sheet. Like, Kylie Olmiller was out there after Kayla Trainer helping change the game, get on SportsCenter, 
take the game to another level. That's why she's on Team USA now. So if that's the case, that's my problem with this. Like if Kylie gets the award there and you're using that same criteria to then give Charlotte the award this year, I'm okay with it. That's my problem is that it doesn't feel like it has stayed the same over the course of the the Yeah, I agree with your point, but I also think that maybe Jamie Ortega was just too consistent over the course of her career. She was great from day one until the last day she was on campus, right? I mean, what she did from day one to the end never surprised you because she was unbelievable as a freshman and got better, a little bit better every single year. Whereas, you know, Charlotte North, you know, she was at Duke and had a great year. I thought she, I thought, I remember, I talked about, I thought she should have been a Twarts on final. Yeah, probably should have been. She was great. She was really good. One of the top goal scorers in the country. But because of the way she ascended so quickly, she became the thing people, and for good reason. She deserves all of the accolades and, and, and all the recognition that she worked towards. And what she obviously got so many fans into the sport that never yeah. before. But maybe Jamie Ortega, over the course of her time at North Carolina, had maybe not the same kind of generational impact. But I'd imagine, I mean, she was also the first athlete to do a name, image, and likeness of lacrosse that we know of, right? Yep. So she also delved into some of those waters for, for a reason, because right. she had a brand of uh, North Carolina, of course, in her back pocket, and also what she had done on the field to prove it at the same time. So I, I just think that maybe because Ortega was so good for so long, maybe people got a little bored with it. And we're like, you know what? Yep, this is just what she does. And maybe... You know, you, you look at some of the criteria and the difference. That's kind of what Logan Wisnowskis was. Well, but that's but right? that's the thing. But Wisnowskis won, well, and Chris Gray won. didn't. Exactly. So what are we? So, so that's Chris, that's my issue with using, this. It's not the using, same criteria. Yeah, if you were using those criteria the same, then Chris Gray for what he did, and he broke the all-time points record. I mean, I mean, you look Lyle at the guys, Thompson's record. You look at the guys beneath him; they are all tour time winners. Yeah. Right, and that that's and he did it, and you say, oh, we got an extra year, but he only had a couple more games, I yeah, think, than Lyle even played. It wasn't that big of a difference. So yeah, it's a bit frustrating when you can't say, okay, here it is, and this is the way it is, and maybe that's the committee, and, and that's how they look at things. But I mean, Charlotte North, not undeserving. I'm just saying that Jamie Ortega was also rather deserving, and you have had in the past co to war Tom winners. Well, and, and, you, I, and I know that's a cop out, you know, yeah. kind of feels like, oh, but whatever. But I think that Jamie Ortega, because she was the best player and the best team, deserved it. And if you want to go and say, oh, Charlotte North, you deserve two for what you did for the sport. That's fine. I, I think that both in their each vein probably should have won the award. But in this but, case, but know, here's the Char- thing. Charlotte North had the better year the year prior. Charlotte and North Ortega already had the year this year. Charlotte North already won the award. Uh, yeah. Like, why did we like it's not like even. You know, when Pat Spencer won it his senior year and he won it over to Granny Ment, he won it because he had a really good year, but also it felt like a little bit of a career recognition. And at that point, everybody thought we were going to have Granny Ment come back for another year in 2020 was supposed to be his year. Well, Charlotte North doesn't near, need the career recognition. She got hers. But then, like, in the biggest stage, she had a, a, a great game in the a great Final Four and a, a nice game of the championship. But her team didn't win. And she was there. Jamie Ortega did help her team win a championship. And they went head-to-head three times throughout the year. To me, like, if it's the best player on the best team, and that's what it's been throughout its history, I just don't understand how Jamie Ortega isn't breaking home with the, walking home with the award, especially when Charlotte North, when she won the championship the year prior and helped her team get there, she was the winner. And it's not like you have to give it to her to, like, recognize. So you have her as, like, oh, she's a tour time winner with everything she's done in her career. She already has a trophy. Yeah, and Ortega, yes, had a lot of talent around her. But I would argue. So did Charlotte North. I would say without Ortega on that team, they don't win the title. And I think that that's how value, and you want to say what value she brought. I don't think they win it because she was the constant in that offense. She stirred the drink. She made things go. Yes, there were other factors. There were other people that were pretty instrumental over the course of her time there. But her consistency, so important to their success, you can't argue with the success that they had. They had, what, one loss in two years. Yeah, I mean, and you, and the thing is, like, both of these teams – when you look up and down the rosters of players, they're going to be coming back. Like both of these teams probably have future towards on finalists or winners on them. So like the cupboard wasn't bare in either situation. No, like yeah. Bell Smith's going to be a towards on finalist at some point. I have to think in her career, look at Caitlin Wurzberger and the list goes on with North Carolina of people that will probably have a chance. So like 
both of them have tremendous talent around them. And when you look at what happened on the field, one team won all the games that they played and won a championship. The other team did not. And to me, that should be that has to be part of the deciding factor. Yeah, I think you're that's right. Been what it that's what we've learned with this award. Yeah. That, now, if you're going to tell me it's going to completely change, then that's fine. I think that ten years down the road, you're going to remember Jamie Ortega's tenure at Carolina for a good reason. And it's it's not like she was just one of the pack, one of the many great ones. She she is going to be remembered for a long time. And unfortunately, she doesn't get the award to, to prove that. But I'm just saying, like her legacy is big. And I think that maybe people underestimated it because. Because she did it for so long, so consistently from the day she stepped on campus. Well, I think that's kind of the bummer about her not winning it is that her legacy should be cemented yeah. in the all-time record books with the Tawartan along with Charlotte North because the two of them in this era have been two of the best players. And I, you also, like, what Jamie Ortega did this year without Katie Hogue for the first time in her career, I think says a lot. Look, look at the number, 44 assists. She, yeah. She was main, when she worked with Katie Hogue, especially at the beginning of her career, she was a big time goal scorer, but she definitely added on to her game. So she got better over like, the years. Yeah, yeah. because like she, w- she walked on campus and this was, that was like the duo. And so this was her first year without that. And she proved every bit to be the star of that show and to be the focal point of this North Carolina offense, she should have won. To me, it's also impressive in its own right to be a star amongst so many other talented players. (laughs) It's like, yeah, Yeah, you can take a back seat pretty easily, but she was the leader of that offense that had a lot of great players around. You can easily say, okay, well, you know, everybody else is is all for one, but um, she needed to be that great, and she was. Yeah, anyway, no offense. Like, Charlotte North is just well-deserving. Like, I mean, an incredible player. She has transcended the game. Her winning two towards on awards, I don't have a problem with. I just, this year, with how the season played out, I felt like North Carolina deserved a little bit more recognition at the end, individually as well, because of what they accomplished. Undefeated season. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Well, uh, that'll do it for today's show. Yeah. Enjoy the lacrosse this weekend, NNL, NLL Finals. you got the PLL as well, so make sure to find a time and place to go watch that. should be fun. And we will see you right back here next week. 